today. We're going to get into because this is a serious topic and um, one that needs to be talked about. And uh, we, we touched on it last week. This is the second part of our series in Let's Get Personal and why it's important that we share uh, what's going on in our lives and how that's part of being a Christian and being open in confession and, and being a part of a family and involved with people who care enough about you and you trust them enough that you can share your deepest struggles with them. And so um, this morning, we are going to specifically focus on depression. And this is something I think the church does not talk about enough. Um, this is something that is very common and prevalent throughout America, um, more so in America than, than um, underdeveloped countries. But we're going to look at what this says in Scripture today and see how can we better serve and minister to those who are struggling or have struggled with this. Okay, All right. So like I said, depression is not something we like to discuss in church, right? It, it, it's not in the Bible in the sense of that word. The only time you're going to see depression in the Bible is in the New Living Translation. Um, but the word depression is not in there, but it is discussed in different forms. For example, in Psalm 42, 5, David says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? In 2 Corinthians 7, 6, Paul references it when he says, But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. We see another instance of David in Psalm 34. He says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. All throughout Scripture, we see these references of being miserable, sad, brokenhearted, downcast, downhearted. We see this all throughout Scripture. See, the word depression in reference to being dejected or a state of sadness or sinking of spirits okay, is, is from, an early 15, from the early 15th century. Okay? It wasn't used as a psychological term like we use now until 1905. All right? So it's a relatively new term. That's why you don't find it in Scripture. Um, but there's a lot of stigma around depression. This is one of the reasons we don't talk about it. Um, but for a second, if you'll indulge me, I want to talk about lobsters. Okay? That seems really strange. But I want to talk about lobsters for just a moment. And uh, I was listening to a, uh, um, a clinical psychologist by the name of Jordan Peterson, and uh, uh, I just think he's a brilliant guy. And he was talking about this study that had come out by, I believe, was a neuroscientist, and he was talking about lobsters and their behaviorisms and, uh, and their mannerisms, their behavior. And he said that one of the things that distinguished a lobster within its hierarchy of dominance was its ability to, I don't know the proper anatomical term, but basically the flexion of its body to be able to stand up on its back legs, right? And we know lobsters are down here. They have their shell on their back, right? But to stand up on its back legs and how, how high or how tall it could do that demonstrated its dominance and would kind of place it on the hierarchy of these, of these lobsters, right? And so they found a correlation there, okay? And with this, I'm going to go ahead and ask Joseph if you would come up just for a second. I kind of put him on the spot here. Um, Joseph, our school psychologist, all right? Um, but there was a correlation between their ability to stand, okay, or their ability to get taller or to, to show dominance versus the amount of serotonin that was in their body, okay? And so within this, within this group or this, this organism, the more serotonin they have was the more their ability to stand up, okay? And this is interesting because when they stand up, they expose the softest, most vulnerable part of their body, right? But when they do that, it shows this confidence, and it puts them on top of the hierarchical ladder. But in the, in, in the same aspect, the, the, the lobsters who had less serotonin in their body couldn't. And so they would stay low, and therefore they would fall under the ladder, on the bottom of the ladder. And this is interesting because as people, serotonin plays a huge role in our lives, right? So can you explain to them just briefly, what is serotonin, what does it do to the human body, and why is it necessary? Serotonin is uh, a chemical inside of our brain that we believe uh, helps to regulate happiness, well-being. Put the mic up to your mouth. That sort of thing. Yeah. So it, it's responsible a lot for our feelings of happiness and well-being. Okay, so when someone is depressed and it's because their serotonin levels are, are low, what do they do? What, what would doctors or clinicians do to help them with that? What they do a lot of times is they will prescribe medications, a lot of which are called SSRIs. Um, Zoloft is one, Prozac. And those work at, um, they're called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they, what they do is they um, won't allow the cells to reuptake the serotonin, and they make more serotonin available for other cells. So okay, okay so, the the, so the medicine itself raises our serotonin levels, and what does that do to our body when our ser serotonin levels it, are raised? It helps our happiness, it helps our feelings of well-being, of uh, feeling good, of, of <coughs> just happiness. Okay, so how, how would I see that manifested in somebody's daily life? Would it, would it affect the way they carry themselves? Yeah, the, it, it 
would affect the way they carry themselves, the way they communicate with others, uh, just the way they act, the way they feel. You know, you can see in somebody how they feel. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so everybody clear on that on our serotonin? All right, Joseph, thank you so much. I appreciate it, brother. All right, so we see within these lobsters, the, the, the level of serotonin is what produces their ability to expose themselves, okay, to expose their vulnerability in a way that shows confidence, in a way that shows, hey, there's more to me than just this. And we find that same thing at work within humans because one of the scariest things in our life is to quit hiding behind our shell but rather expose the most vulnerable parts of us, to expose the parts that are the deepest, the most true parts of who we are. And yet this idea that there's this biological process that takes place within us that can aid or hinder that is something that, first of all, we need to make sure we understand before we talk about depression. Because I think a lot of times we want to say, well, it's just a spiritual problem and you just need to pray it away. And if, and if we lay hands on you and pray and God will heal you, yes, that absolutely can happen. But you know what? God also made us as organisms. And our bodies work a certain way. And each one of us has a certain walk, a path to take. And there are other things that take place. So if you would, Emily, are you up there? Can you come down here for just a second, please? I like putting people on the spot. It's one of my privileges as a teacher. Okay? I'm, as she comes down here. There is a stigma around taking medicine for depression. As if, as individuals, we don't want to take it because then we're broken. Then we can't fix ourselves. And interestingly enough, one of the problems with modern medicine is the fact that we don't take what's prescribed to us. Okay? How many here have pets? Okay? How many have taken your pet to the vet and they've been like, okay, here's what you need to give your animal. Make sure you give it to them at this time of day. You can put it in a piece of cheese or whatever, but make sure if they take this, it'll get better. And how many of you follow those directions to a T? You go get the medicine, you feed your animal, you make sure that they're taken care of. Now, you can come on up, sweetie. Um, I'm loving the boots, okay? Um, now, you come on up if you would. Um, but now, how many of you have ever been, you've gone to the doctor yourself and the doctor has prescribed you some medication and you didn't go pick it up? Be honest. You didn't go pick up your prescription, okay? Now, how many of you have picked up your prescription, but you didn't take it? How many have not finished your prescription before? All right? Isn't it crazy that we think more of our animals than we do of ourselves? Think about that for just a minute. But yet, when it comes to other things in our lives, other types of medications, there's no way we would go without it. And for those that don't know, Emily's a trooper, okay? I'm bringing her up here because I know she doesn't mind to talk about this. But Emily has type 1 diabetes, okay? And she also has Crohn's disease. And she is just awesome. Awesome. But let me ask you this. What happens if you don't do anything? I know there's things that you can t take as far as, like, making sure you eat right and pay attention to certain foods. But what would happen if you didn't take your insulin, you didn't pay attention to your sugar levels? What would happen? Um, I would go into decay and could possibly die. Could possibly die. So when the doctor said, and I know if you don't, don't know Paula, Paula's, like, hardcore um, raising money for JDRF. It's, it's pretty phenomenal what they do. But if the doctor said, okay, here, you need to take this insulin, what's the chances that you're not going to take it if you need it? Zero. Zero. Why? And she's not ashamed of that. You know why? Because Emily likes to live, right? She loves life, and she loves to be able to serve and to do the things that, that God has called her to do. And so when we look at this, she's not ashamed of having to take insulin. She's not ashamed. This is who she is, right? And this is who God has made her be. And I guarantee you, if you get to know Emily, you'll be much, more, you'll be much better off for knowing her. Okay, because of the testimony that God has put in her life. And I'm so thankful for her and her family for the service they do. The church mom's beaming up there, granny's beaming up there, or nanny, sorry. I think it means called granny. Um, but God is good. But God is also good in the midst of taking medication. All right? I want to I want to start with that first and foremost. Thank you so much for coming down here. I appreciate you. Okay. That that's something we need as a church to get away from that if someone takes medication for whatever their sickness is, whatever their ailment is, whatever their, their issue is at the moment, that's not sin. Addiction is sin, but taking medicine because you have an issue that needs to be balanced is not sin. Because here's the thing, guys, we are all affected by the fall. We are all affected by sin in this world. This world is no longer perfect. It's no longer perfect. And therefore, each one of us is going to have different effects of that in our lives. We're broken people. We're temporary jars of clay, the Bible tells us. And there are times when we have to do things and take things that will take care of us in a way we can't take, uh, take care of in ourselves. So we look at those lobsters and their level of serotonin, and we need to recognize that, hey, the same creator that made them made us, and that same level of serotonin plays a role in our life as well, okay? So that's the first thing I want to say. It's not just about the spiritual side of things. 
I can't help you with that. I can't help you with the physical issues. There are doctors, clinicians, um, therapists that are great at what they do. And if you need to know some of those people, we can get you in contact with some great people who can help you and serve you in a way that is God-honoring and faithful and good for the problems that you're going through. Now, today I strictly want to talk about the spiritual side of it. I'm not a doctor, okay? It's not my profession, all right? Uh, we have people, we have multiple counselors within our, within our congregation who would love to speak with you and talk with you if that's um, where you need to be. But today I want to talk about the spiritual side of things, okay? Because we're at war. Every day we're at war. And the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, okay? He went looking for someone to devour, and he will devour everybody in a different way, okay? How many of y'all eat food differently? Now, here's what I mean, okay? If you have a chicken breast on your plate, very few of you probably just grab that by the handful and start gnawing on it, right? But you probably cut it up with a fork or knife, and, and, and you eat it. You may dip it in your preferred sauce or whatever. Do any of y'all eat chicken wings like that? Anybody actually, like, cut up their little chicken wing? You know? No. You grab that thing, and you stick it in your mouth, okay? You might chew on it sideways. Some of you all do the bite and pull, right? And you just pull all the meat off of it in one, one fell swoop, right? The devil does the same thing to each one of us. He has a certain way to get at each one of us. None of us are the same in this aspect except for the fact that he's coming for you. And if you don't think he is, it's probably already got you. We need to recognize that there's a battle going on, and it goes, and it says that we fight against the principalities of this world, not against the flesh and blood. And he's going after our hearts. He's going after our minds. We talked about this several weeks ago about the effects of Satan and what he's doing, and we have to be aware of that. And he plays a role in our minds. He feeds us lies. He, he preys on our insecurities. And in a world and society filled with so many fixes, now, don't you think about this, and I'm not knocking any of our hairdressers because we have multiple ones in the church, any of our makeup artists, any of our women, okay? All right? I'm not knocking you at all, but we live in a world where we try to cover up a lot. A lot. We try to produce this look or this appearance or this portrayal of ourselves that in a lot of ways is not real. One of my favorite things about Leah when we were first starting to date was that she, I love when we go work out, we go run. Because Leah would come out with very little makeup on, and I was like, man, she's pretty, you know? Like, I didn't have to worry about that. Like, when we got married, she'd come out from taking a shower and be like, who is that? You know, we didn't have to worry about that, okay? Because I knew what she looked like, and I, and I love that, and I think God made us to be, to be beautiful in, in, in our own way. He made us perfect for his design for us, but a lot of times we allow life and allow other things to change how we view ourselves. You know I mean? I remember the first time I learned the word Spanx, okay, and that wasn't a verb that my parents did when I got in trouble. It was a piece of clothing that people wear to hide chubbiness, okay, and uh, we do this all the time, and it's just crazy the amount of products that are coming out so that we can hide ourselves. We can hide who we really are, and we do the same thing spiritually all the time. We try, to, we try to have the right music playing. We have to try to have the right dress going on. We go to the right church. We, we hang out with the right people, but inside we're dying, Inside, we're struggling, and we can't let anybody know what's really going on. But at, at some point, we get to a place where we are so far gone that we feel there's no way back out. And, and to expose ourselves would be devastating, and therefore we can't, so we have to keep the charade going. Let me tell you something, guys. It's exhausting. It's exhausting the amount of work that we put in to hide what's really going on in our lives because we hide our shame. We hide our anxieties. We hide our fear. We hide our disappointment, we hide our anger, we hide our failure. And all this stuff going on in our minds, when someone is depressed or struggling with depression, there's no on-off switch. It's constant. Constant. And it's become so swirling that they don't even know where to start if they wanted to start to fix it. Because it's everywhere. How do I deal with all this? And that's why we have to have people in our lives to lean on in those moments. And we have to realize that there are lies the devil tells us, but God tells us to take captive those thoughts and make them obedient to Jesus Christ, that he wants to renew us in our mind. And so I want to look at scripture this, this morning. I'm going to read Ezekiel, um, just chapter 1, and if you get a chance to, to read it at some point, um, Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes chapter, one, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, but if you've ever read Ecclesiastes, it is probably one of the most downer books in scripture, if not the most. And it's interesting enough, because as you see in this first chapter, Solomon is the writer here. And he talks about how he has all this wisdom, because if you know, Solomon asked God for wisdom over riches and women and anything else. He said, I want wisdom. And what happened in his wisdom, he began to see as things really are. 
And, and this first chapter is, in my opinion, idyllic of what somebody who's going through depression or going through the sadness of the soul is dealing with. And so let's look at this. And he says, The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come, generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I thought to myself, look, I have grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this, too, is a chasing after the wind. For with much, much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. If that's not the most depressing outlook on life you've ever heard, I don't know what is. He's saying, I, I know more than anybody on this planet, and I look around me, and all I see is grief. That's what one thing Jordan Peterson says. He says, life is about tragedy. Tragedy is the norm for us. And, and I don't know that I fully agree with that, but it's very true in our lives that we typically, we know bad things are coming. We dread bad things because we know they're coming. I have three grandparents that are still living right now. We were talking about this last night. And one of my dreads, one of my fears is that I'm going to lose them all in a very short amount of time. Because I've not had to experience much loss in my family, in my life. But I feel like they're going to go pretty quickly with one another. And that's a sad thing for me, but I know it's coming. I know it's coming. I can't prepare myself for it, but I know it's coming. And so here he has this outlook on life that, listen, the more I know, the more I dread. This is meaningless. Everything we're doing, we're chasing after the sun is meaningless. Think about this. You pay your bills every day. Why? So eventually somebody else can buy your house. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the mindset he has here. He's like, I do this job, I do this job, and eventually somebody's going to replace me. That school's still going to be there when I'm done. This church will still be here when I'm done. Everything I'm doing is meaningless, but at the end of this book, he tells you this, everything is meaningless, but serve God. That's the only thing in this life that's not meaningless. And so listen to what he's saying here. He's, saying, he's not saying, if you serve God, everything will have meaning, and everything will be worthwhile, and everything will be great. He's saying, no, everything is meaningless, but serve God. Because the only thing that matters is what happens after this life. This life is temporary. This life is, is a mist, it says. And we have an opportunity here to make a choice that determines our eternity, but that choice in determining our eternity changes how we live the right now. And that's the only way we can find meaning in this life, is through Jesus. Because the hard times are going to come. So what about Scripture? And I think this gives us hope this morning, because there are numerous heroes, numerous heroes in Scripture who struggle with depression. Who struggle with these low nights, these, these bad thoughts, these downcast, broken-hearted moments. People like Moses, people like Hannah, Naomi, Elijah, Job, Jesus himself in the garden. If sweating blood doesn't mean you're in a low place, I don't know what does. We know that he even found himself in that moment. David, Solomon, these are people that we read through. Paul himself struggled. And these are people that we look at as, as like these leaders in the faith. And if we were really honest and looked at their lives, we'd see a lot of ourselves in them. A lot of our own struggles and shortcomings. For example, you know, Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes. Multiple times in Scripture, David mentions this, especially in the Psalms. Think about Psalm 23. The Psalm we all know and we recognize. We're like, oh, this is such a beautiful thing. What does he say? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then he goes on to say that even though 
I walk where? Through the valley of the shadow of death. Guys, that is just straight symbolism of this is where I am. I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Death is on my door. It's on my heels. Even though I walk through it, I will not fear because he's with me. In Ruth chapter 1, we see Naomi has lost both her sons, which Delilah so appropriately told us two weeks ago. She lost both her sons. Her daughters-in-law um, were still with her. Orpah decided to go on back. Ruth decided to stay with her. But you know, Naomi wanted to change her name, didn't she? She wanted to change her name, and the name that she wanted to change it to meant bitter. Because the name Naomi means something to the effect of joy or happiness or pleasant. That was her life. And a situation happened in her life where now she, she was to the point, she's like, don't stay with me, get away from me, move on with your life. I have nothing to offer you. I can't give you another son. I have no money. You know what? Just change my name to bitter. How many of us have been there? You know what? This is my life just can't get any worse. This, this is who I am now. That's where she was. First Kings 18. This is oftentimes a passage people preach from about depression about struggling with these lon- this, this loneliness of the soul. And this is the story of Elijah. And this is right after Elijah just had one of the greatest spiritual victories of all time when he challenged the Baal prophets. And he said, you know what, do this deal. We'll see whose God rains fire out of heaven. And he, and he has them bring all this stuff together. And you can read that in, in 1 Kings 17 if you want to at some point. But in 1 Kings 18, right after this happens, Ahab, King Ahab, goes back and tells Jezebel about what's going on. And Jezebel's like, find that man and kill him. Kill him. And he retreats. Elijah goes from being this man who's just had this huge victory. People just watch God literally pour fire from heaven, envelop this, this sacrifice and the others, and then he killed all the Baal prophets. He just had this huge victory for God, and all of a sudden, you know what he does? He flees. He runs. It says he runs into the woods, and he hides underneath this tree. That was The tree that it describes is basically a nothing tree, so it couldn't shade him more than anything. And he sits there, and he says, you know what, God? Just kill me. Just kill me. And it can happen that quickly that we go from being in a good state of mind to a negative state of mind. If you've ever talked to somebody who struggles from depression, struggles from anxiety, sometimes it hits them in a wave and there's no reason for it. It just comes and it goes. You have other people, it's it's driven by something that's happened in their life. And this is what we see, Elijah, that he's just poured himself out so he's exhausted. And at the same time, he is now in stress because someone is coming after him. And so he's like, you know what, God, it would be better if you just kill me. Just go ahead and end this, and I don't have to worry about this anymore. I don't have to worry about them coming because I don't know what's going to happen. And it's just like, boom, it just happened like that. And some of us are go through that daily. We're like, man, this is a good day. And then something happens, and boom, the switch is flipped. And now we're struggling. Everything's bad. Everything's negative. We know in Elijah's case, God took care of him. God led him to the back of a cave where he restored him, made him rest, made him eat, put him back where he needed to be, and he could go and tell Ahab what was going on and and could lead them. You know, Hannah was barren, was not going to have any children, and yet it says God remembered her. In this lowliness of heart, this lowliness of soul, God remembered her. And does anybody know who she gave birth to? Samuel. The prophet Samuel. So why are we talking about all this, though? Because this is something that, even though it's all throughout Scripture, all entangled in these people's lives because we're humans and we ride this high and this low, we typically don't mention it until it's too late. I mentioned last week that pastor from Inland Hills in California, uh, Andrew Steckline. You know, he, he committed suicide about two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, when he had seemingly had everything together, seemingly had everything that you could, you know, think a person would want, and yet he still was struggling from depression and was even open about it. But something just didn't click. And it's the first thing I want to say is that that did not make him any less a believer in Jesus Christ. The fact that he was dealing with something personally, something possibly chemically, that this mental illness was going on in his life did not mean he did not love the Lord. It did not mean that he was not saved. It did not mean that he's not with Christ now. That's not our job. That's not our job to make that call. You cannot show me any place in Scripture that says if you do this, you're done. 
Because if that's the case, if our last moment on earth is a sin, if I go out and I'm going to take John Piper's example, if I get upset with Leah and I storm out of the house and I get in my car and I'm angry and I'm hammering down the road and I'm mad to the point of sin mad, I'm, I'm angry that much and I'm driving crazily and I lose control going around the turn and I hit a tree and I die, I die in sin. Does that mean I'm not saved? I pray not. I pray not because why does that sin have trump over any other sin that was in my life that Jesus paid for? Because in my moment of sin, my moment of mistake, my moment of error, that doesn't determine my faith because Jesus said, I came to die for all sin. When you put your trust in me, your faith in me, I've washed you clean. We, 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 we play a very dangerous game, don't get me wrong, if we want to take that chance. But we also play a very judgmental game when we want to be the judge. When we want to declare someone in heaven or hell, we got enough to worry about on our own. Enough to worry about in our own life, be praying for others. So in this moment, just a couple of facts for you all this morning as to why this is important within the church. Some of y'all this morning, you're in the seat going, man, you're talking about me. How'd you know? How'd you know I'm going through this? I don't. I don't, but statistics don't lie. One in five adults struggle with mental health problems. One in five. Okay? That's 43.4 million people in the United States struggle with mental health problems. This is where it gets scary. One in eight youth, 12 to 17 years old, suffer at least one major depressive episode in the last year. 12 to 17 years old. What do they have to be depressed about? Our society gives them a lot of stuff. Feeds them a lot of lies. You know what Satan's going to do? If he, can't take, if he can't take down the saints, he's going to take down their children. 8.2 million, or 8.2 percent, which is 1.9 million people, experienced severe depression in the past year. And the suicide rate in our country has increased 30% since 1999. 30%. And oftentimes that is due to depression. So if we don't think we need to talk about this, we're missing it. We're missing it. Because what did Jesus come to do? He came to heal the sick, give the blind sight, raise the dead, and to save the lost. That's what he came to do. And we are to carry on that mission. We are to carry on and help save those who Satan wants to tear down. And so I'm going to point out just a couple things, and, and, and we'll close it up this morning. But first things first, we need to recognize that, that depression comes in all myriads of shapes and sizes, okay? It's, it can be situational. It can be biochemical. It can be based on a long series of events, a lot of different things. In um, the DSM, okay, the um, Diagnostic statistical manual that he gave me, which is basically all your definitions of all these different things, which, wow, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, but it talks about depression, and I didn't realize this until I was reading it, but there are so many different types of depression. We say, I suffer from depression. Well, what do you mean? What do you mean? Because there's all kinds of ways, but it says, bless you. It says the one thing that ties all these things together is that they all demonstrate a sadness of the soul, just a melancholy or an inability to function properly. This stuff affects us, right? Just like sin affects us. It affects how we see the world. It affects how we see each other, how we see ourselves. Depression will do this, and it's like a cloud. And you feel like you can't get out of the cloud, right? And I'm going to borrow from a sermon of a guy I listened to the other day for these next four things, and, and I want you to hear this. That when we talk about this cloud, when we talk about these struggles, there's four stages that we go through spiritually, spiritually, okay? The first is we become downcast. And downcast is typically some event in our life, something, something singular that we can pinpoint has happened and we become sad or we are downhearted about this event, okay? An example of that would have been David, right? David is one of the, who, oh God, hear me right now. We see it throughout his, throughout his messages when he has the moment where he, he does all this with Bathsheba. We talked about last week, and he finds himself where he's about to lose his child, and he is brokenhearted because of this instance, because of what he did. He's, down he's downcast because of this, this moment. The next stage would be discouragement, and that's when it lasts a little bit longer. Because down, if you're downcast, it might last a day or two. When you're discouraged, it may last a week. And this, this one moment begins to tint all the other moments in your life. Naomi's a good example of that. She lost her sons and, then, and her husband, and then all of a sudden, as it goes, she's like, you know what, I, just, there's, I have nothing to offer. 
I just need to change my name. You all go away from me. She's now discouraged because I just don't know if there's any way I can come out of this. And then you get to depression. And Job's a good example of that. Where depression is now, you no longer can pinpoint whatever that singular moment was. Rather now, every moment just seems the same. That I am now in a place where I don't know if I'll ever make it out. I don't know if this is how it's going to be now. I'm just, I, just, I don't know why I feel this way. And some of us have been there. Some of us are there right now this morning. You're like, I just don't know why I feel this way. That's depression. And last but not least is despair. And despair is where we find ourselves that not only is it long-lasting, not only can we not pinpoint it, but we don't think there's any way out and never will be. And Elijah is a good example of that. There's no way out, God. Just take my life. Just end it. And oftentimes we see that that unfortunately is one of the worst effects of depression is suicide. You know, typical signs, and I say this with a tongue-in-cheek, typical signs of somebody who's depressed, sadness, emptiness, they feel worthless, they feel guilty, they're irritable, they're hopeless, they feel hopeless, they have less interest in the things they may have had interest in before, their life may be crumbling around them. They may have less energy than used to, there's changes in their appetite, changes in their sleep, they have body aches, their health declines. But at the same time, they could demonstrate all the exact opposite of those things. Now they're seeing that, that people who are depressed actually begin to excel. They excel at stuff. Why? To hide it. To cover it up. So no one sees what they're going through. So you know what? If I do better, no one will see what's actually going on. And I do this activity with my, my kids in, in class every year. Uh, and, it, and it plays a role in sign language because the, the uh, suicide rate and, and ideation or thought of it is, is greater in the deaf community than the hearing community. So we talk about this in class, but it's also beneficial for my students in general. But we got to stop pretending. The church has got to start this. Okay? As Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, as much as we have control of, we've got to stop pretending. We've got to stop acting like you've got it together. Stop buying into the lie that you're too broken, that no one will understand your, what you're going through, that you can't get better. And that you have to fake it. Fake it till you make it might be one of the worst phrases that's ever come out. It might be one of the worst philosophies we could possibly come up with. Fake it till you make it. Because you know what? You never will. You'll never make it. So what can we learn from Scripture today when we talk about mental health? That everyone struggles. There's not a person in this room that can't say they've not had a long night or a sad thought or a depressed state. Some of you may be more often than others. Some of you deeper or darker than others. But everyone struggles. And I do this activity with my classes where I ask them, you know, what's the hardest thing about being in high school? And they give me all, being a teenager, and they give me all these responses, and all of them are legitimate to them. Some of, you, some of us, if we saw them, we'd be like, that's not a problem. You know, you don't know until you're an adult. Well, it's real to them. And what I do is I like to correlate this. And so I go through and I look at their list and I check off all the things that I personally dealt with as a teenager. I'm like, I know what you mean. This is where I was. I'm, you know, 15 or 20 that you mentioned, I've dealt with. And then we go on and we talk about how would we fix the school? How would we change how the school operates and what would make the school a better place? And it's interesting because everything, just about everything they do, and I do this on purpose, everything they put up there would benefit them individually, but not collectively the whole. Because our thoughts are on who? Us. All the time. And when you're in a depressed state, in general, no one else is as important as you are. In that sense. And I don't mean you value yourself. I mean your focus is on you and you alone. So you don't hear what other people say to you. You don't internalize what they say to you. You're not worried so much about listening to God because this is how I feel and this is, must be how it is. And so we, we point out to them that, hey, listen, you, know, you want better lunches at school? That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But what happens if you want better lunches? You have to start paying for it. What happens if you start paying for it? The kids don't get free lunch anymore. What about the kids in your school who that's the only meal they ever get? The kids in your school who take two lunches home so they can eat on the weekends. And they're like, I never thought about that. No. Because typically we don't look to see the people that are struggling. We don't look outside of ourselves. And if as a church, as believers, if we're going to help those who are struggling, we've got to get out of our own minds and we've got to start looking for the need. And then it brings us to the question where I say, okay, 
Describe for me someone who struggles with, it, with anxiety, self-esteem issues, depression, or suicidal thoughts. And they give me this litany of things like we just mentioned. All these things that go through. And I ask them, is this everything? And they're like, yeah, I think that's, I think that's it. I said, okay. What happens if, nobody, if somebody displays none of those thoughts? None of those characteristics. And they're just like, huh? And they just think about it for a second. I said, because when I was 19 and I almost took my life, none of those applied to me. I was 19 years old. I remember where I was. I remember what was going on in my life. I remember what I was thinking. And I remember thinking, you know what? If I just took some pills tonight, I wouldn't have to worry about this ever again. Ever. And it's that, in that moment, God was like, are you kidding me? Wake up. And it's because I was tired of putting on a front. I was tired of faking it. Because I had this whole other life going on on the side that I was making sure nobody else knew about. And then I had this good Christian boy side that I was putting up in front of everybody else. And I was exhausted. I was exhausted trying to live up to expectations that I thought were there for me, but they really weren't. It was in my mind. I was tired of trying to just be this certain thing that I knew I wasn't. And guys, it wore me down to the point that I was like, you know what, it'd be better if I just didn't have to deal with any of this. And I think there's some of you here this morning, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been there. You might be there right now. And what I learned in all of it, and that was before I'd truly given my life to Jesus Christ. I was in the midst of this battle and forth, back and forth from my mind, from my heart. And finally, I was like, you know what, I'm tired of doing this, God. I'm tired of dealing with all this stuff. I want you to have it all. And that was the night that I truly gave my life to Christ. And I'm not saying I woke up the next day and the struggles wasn't there. The, yeah, absolutely it was. It was a battle. But I began to gain ground. And he began to put people in my life to help me gain ground. And, and we were talking about this last night. I had some people over at the house. And, you know, the pastor in general oftentimes bears a lot more burden than the people in the church in the sense that the church itself looks to the pastor to bear their burden. And who does the pastor look to? I don't feel like that here. I don't feel like that here. Because I feel like I have so many people in my life, in these pews right now, that I can call on, that I can count on, that send me messages that I know are praying for me. I don't feel like I'm carrying the burden all by myself. And I'm so thankful to you all for that. I'm thankful that we have a family here at First Christian that looks out for one another. And I've never experienced that in my life at a church, ever. And so I thank you all for that. It speaks volumes about what God's doing in this place. But some people don't have that. And they're walking this journey by themselves, and they're struggling. And they're struggling. But most of us don't want to ask them the hard questions. We don't want to ask them, hey, what's going on in your life right now? Are you down? What's, what's happening? You know, is, are you okay? I know this, this happened at work. Or how are you doing? You can talk to me. We don't have those kind of relationships with people because it takes time and it takes effort. And it gets messy. But one thing you need to know this morning is that everyone struggles. Nobody's immune to depression. Nobody. And I say that from personal experience. I have family members who have struggled with it, family members who deal with it. I've seen the effects of it firsthand. And it's, it's hard. It's difficult. But that being said, everyone needs somebody. Pray for your church. Pray for me. I'm praying for you. God convicted me about that just recently. I was talking to Sean about that the other day. I need to be praying for you all more that God will move in your life. Be praying that he shows us ways to help you, that he shows us how to lead you. But the good thing in all of this, if you're struggling this morning, you can find rest in God. You can find rest. He says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and you'll find rest. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. God invites you to bring your garbage. He invites you to bring your junk. He invites you to bring your hurts to him. And that's so countercultural. That's so against what we feel is the norm. We can't present this garbage to people because then they'll look at us weird and be like, what is wrong with you? But in reality, if we were to do that, most people would be like, I understand. I understand where you are because I'm there too or I've been there. If you're not there and you haven't been there, you may one day. And the devil's a liar. And he will accuse you and accuse you and blame you and try to drag you down. But there's a new song out by a woman named Lauren Daigle called You Say. It says, you say I am loved when I don't feel a thing. That's one of the most profound statements that I've ever heard about God. When I don't feel like I'm loved, I don't feel like I'm worth anything, God looks at you like, 
like you're his prized possession. He looks at you like you look at your baby when they're born. I love him. I love you. Even when you feel like, God, I don't have, any, I don't have anything to offer you. I, I'm worthless. I have no purpose on this planet. And God says, yes, you do, because I made you with one. I made you to have purpose, but you'll only find it in me. He tells us that this morning. Hope is what he offers, but we have to come with open hearts, and we have to admit our brokenness. Our path to redemption on the spiritual side of depression is by making Jesus Christ our Lord. It's coming to him with our faults and our, our failures and saying, look, I can't do this anymore. Will you take this from me? Will you wash me clean? Will you make me new? I believe that you are a Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I repent from what I've done. Will you be my Lord? And this is the offer he, that, that he gives us that we can come to him freely. And he says, if you do, I will separate you from your sin. I will separate you. Not only this, he says, I will be with you until the very end of the age. He's going to walk every step with us. And so the moments that you're like, I, the devil's telling you, you know what, you're alone. There's nobody with you. You get to say, no, sorry, brother. Christ is right here. The Holy Spirit lives in me. I worship the Father and the Son walks with me. I'm not alone. But he asks us to bring those things to him, to bring our struggles, to bring our hurts. There's some of you here this morning who know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're struggling. And you think, well, I'm a Christian. I shouldn't struggle with stuff. No, that's not true. Life is hard. Life is hard, and we all come from different circumstances and different events. And some of you may be struggling right now. You're like, man, listen, I, I've been thinking about taking my own life. I've been struggling with depression. I don't know how I'm going to go to the next day. And God says, bring it to me. Lay it at my feet and let me help you. So this morning, we're not going to sing this last song. That's not what this is about. This is an invitation. This is not a time for, for singing. This is a time for, for just looking inside yourself. If you need to respond to God this morning, if you need prayer, you need restoration, you need redemption, you need to know him as your Savior, whatever is on your heart this morning, won't you come to the altar? Won't you come? Because here's what happens at an altar. You bring things to die to the altar. And there are things in your life that need to die today. And so this morning, I want to ask you to just bow your heads and close your eyes as they play and sing this. And if you have a decision to make, if you need prayer, if you need to decide something this morning, this is your time to come forward. All heads bowed and eyes closed. If you need to make a decision, won't you come?